I prepared a booklet which uh, has some documents in it that I think will assist us as we go forward. And we have also put those documents in the slideshow that hopefully we'll be able to show at the same time. Um, the issue here is about whether or not the definition of accessory use is met by the power plant. And also, the issue is about whether or not, if it is an accessory use, does it impair the view? We believe that the project fails to satisfy the ordinance of the laws. We want to start for, first with the definition of accessory use. You've seen it already. Customary, incidental, and subordinate, those are the three key concepts. And so I want to go through all three of those. First, the next slide, um, deals with what's customarily. Well, the statute doesn't define it, but the statute says use Webster's. So that's what we did. Webster's for customarily says, by custom, or in a customary manner. So those are the words that really drive the definition here. And I've got both of them. What they say is that customary is something that's commonly practiced, used, or observed, familiar through long use or acquaintance. Custom is a course of action characteristically repeated under like circumstances, a usage or practice that is common to many. <clears throat> Delaware law echoes this notion. In the McKinney case, which we cited in our brief, we included a copy in our binders of exhibits, says, customary in the context of accessory use, quote, requires close scrutiny to determine whether the proposed use is commonly, habitually, and by long practice been established as reasonably related to the primary use. The question really in this case is whether or not data centers with power plants that run in island mode, which is what TDC says it's going to do. Are those data centers, in the words of Webster's, commonly practiced or observed? In the words of McKinney, is that data center with a power plant in island mode, is it commonly, habitually, or by long practice been established? And the answer is no. How do we know that? Well, first, TDC says it. In many representations made to the city and to the residents of Newark, TDC has said things like, the, T the TDC data center will be the first data center which is built using this combination of existing technologies. They've said using this technology, this combination of a data center with a power plant, is so unique we have a patent pending on the design. And on their website, TDC says no other company in the world has co-located a high-density data center with a high-efficiency co-generation power. TDC says it's different. And that brings us really to the next tab, just tab three, and that's the patent. Now, why are we harping on patent application? Do I care about whether or not the cup covers up the coffee? No. What I care about is what the patent application says. Because in order to get a patent in the United States, you have to prove that what it is you want a patent for is new, is novel. And that's why you're entitled to the monopoly that the patent will give you. You've come up with a new idea. So, the president of TDC, Mr. Robert Crispin, the CEO of TDC, Mr. Gene Kern, they file a patent application. And what is it that they say is new and novel? Well, tab three in your book gives you that. And the first page is just showing you that that's the cover of it. But really, the page I want you to look at is the second page of the tab. Here's what they claim is new and novel. An apparatus comprising a power plant and a data center located on the same site. That's what's 
new and novel, according to the president and the CEO of DDC. So they say this is something that hasn't been done before. Well, now what TDC and the city are saying is, oh, no, 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 everybody's doing this, which is kind of interesting, given that the president says nobody has, TDC says nobody in the world has. They say everybody does it. But what do they say? Everybody does power generation on site. We got a backup generator, and that's power generation. And so the argument really is that it's customary, it's commonly done by everybody because there's power generation in some form on the site of data centers. And I think that that argument doesn't fly. And it doesn't fly for a couple of different reasons. First, TDC says it's different. Maybe we shouldn't believe them. But they say it's different. The president says it's so different, it's so new, it's so novel, I should get a patent for it. Second, island mode, which is what TDC says they're going to do, is fundamentally different. You know, in a backup situation, you run off the grid. If the power goes down, your batteries kick in, and then your generators kick in to provide just the IT critical load until the utility comes back on. And then you turn off your backup generators, and you go back to using the grid. What TDC is saying is, we are not going to have a connection to the grid. Instead, we're going to provide all the power ourselves. So we've got to build a system that is not just enough power, but we've got to have all this backup power, which means we've got to have a lot more equipment, a lot more facility, a lot more complicated system. That's a difference in kind from backup generators, okay, processing the data center. It's a different in kind. And the third reason why I think this argument of generation on site is enough to justify a 279 megawatt power plant is because it leads to an absurd result. You know, every residential category, every residential district in the city of New York's zoning code allows accessory uses in a residential district. And I'm pretty confident that there are people in the city of Newark who, having endured one too many power outages when the storm comes through, went over to Lowe's and bought themselves a nice little backup generator. They run off the grid most of the time, but you know what? When the power goes down because some branch knocked out the power line, they fire up the backup generator that runs the refrigerator and everything else. And when the grid comes back on, they turn off the generator. By the logic that's being used by the city and by TDC, because there's backup generator happening at houses throughout the city of New York, then that means everybody in the residential zone can have a power plant in their backyard. <laughs> power generation, it's on site, it's related to the use. That's a crazy and absurd view of what that means. Power generation isn't the issue. It's what TDC wants to do, which is an island mode. And nobody, nobody does it like that. It's not common. It's not habitual. It's not recognized by long practice. This is not customary. The next issue, tab four, is about incidental. You saw the definition. It's supportive. It's non-essential. That's what Webster says. N32-4B tells us, follow Webster's. But what both TDC and the city want you to do is to say, no, 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 don't focus on the non-essential stuff. I can't blame you. This power plant is essential to the operation of this data center. Without the power plant, the data center doesn't work. It's not non-essential. It's at the very core of what TDC wants to and needs to do. But they say, oh, no, no, that's not the test. Go look at the Wigan case, because the Wigan case has language which says there has to be a reasonable relationship to the primary use. That's the test they want you to apply. Here's the problem. 
The Wiccan case relies upon a case out of New Jersey called Charlie Brown of Chatham versus the Board of Adjustment of Chatham Township. Now, for those of you keeping score at home, that's 495 Atlantic 2nd, 119. And that case involved a restaurant that wanted to build sleeping quarters for its employees and said that the sleeping quarters were accessories. The court says, no, it's not. And here's what the court says that the Wiccan court relied upon. Quote, the word incidental, as employed in the definition of accessory use, incorporates two concepts. It means that the use must be one which is subordinate and minor in significance. It must also incorporate the concept of reasonable relationship with the primary use. Two concepts, reasonable relationship and minor in significance. This part is minor in significance. It's the core, it's what makes this data center work. And so it's not incidental. It's totally essential. And therefore can't meet that part of the definition of the code. Finally, subordinate. Tab 5. Webster's definition of subordinate placed in the lower rank, class, order. Holding a lower or inferior position. The problem here is about the sale of and I heard Mr. Walton today say, well, don't worry about the sale of power because we put this 30% cap. And I think he said in response to the question that was raised by Mr. Hudson, and it's clear in the affidavit of Ms. Feeney Rosman, who is, was attached to the March 14 file, that anything above 30% sale of electricity means you're starting to get towards primary use, and that's not allowed as an accessory use. Mr. Walton claims, don't worry, they'll never sell more than 30%. Because we've got a provision which says, you know what, if they need less power, we can adjust it down. I read the letter after he said that. I can't find a condition that says that. What does the letter say? It says you can sell up to 30% of the required operating capacity, the design amount that you need. Appellant's Exhibit 26 is the affidavit of Michael Griffin, who went and looked at the data about this. And what he found was that TDC's own consultant, 451 Research, said all you're going to need to do is to provide 200 watts of power per square foot of data center space. That's all your customers are going to want. But they designed it to be three times as large. And if you're running off the design, that means they get to have that cushion of an extra 400 watts per square foot that they can sell. The affidavit tells you that the percentage is not 30%, it's more like 50% of the power that's going to be generated. And by the Andy Rosner affidavit, that itself is enough to show it's not supported. Look, it's not customary. Nobody else does it. It's not incidental because it's essential to the operation of the data center. And it's not supported because they're going to make a ton of money, selling a ton of electricity. This isn't an accessory use. Okay, you might disagree with me. You might say, well, no, you know what, we'll find it is an accessory use. Then that gets us to the second issue. Section 3253 of the code says that an accessory use shall not impair the neighborhood. raises two questions. First, what's the neighborhood? The city kind of has a really interesting sort of evolving view on this. It started out by saying, you know what, the neighborhood is just the star campus. Then in its March 14 filing, it said, no, 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 it's not the star campus. It's the STC zone. And that's kind of important, tab 6. Tab 6 is the zoning map. It's the zoning map for the whole thing. That's the first page you have 
their second key is to blow up. This is the star key as shown on the zoning map. And you know what? It's not all STC zoning. Just like Ms. Hoffman said, there's this big thrusting shape that zoned them on. That's where the blue energy facility is at. So here's the oddity of the, of the city's position. Imagine a person who is standing on the eastern edge of that MI zone area, just inside the lawn. He's getting the sound, he's getting the air pollution, he's getting all the effects of that power plant. But you know what? According to the city, he's not in the neighborhood. We can't talk about those impacts. But if he takes one step back eastward, so that now he's in the orange of the map, now those impacts matter because he's in the neighborhood. That's crazy. And it's crazy because the notion of neighborhood is about an area around. It's about vicinity. Now, I'm not making this up. The Supreme Court of Delaware, the Gucci's Bridge case, we gave you a copy of that in the appendix in, in another uh, uh, binders of exhibits. They said, you know what? That rock crushing operation just outside the, uh, Newark, it was going to send pollutants up into the air that would go a mile away. It didn't say, gee, you, we only care about what's in the zoning district. It said a mile away, and that's enough evidence to show an impairment of the neighborhood. It's distance, not distance. And you know what? I think that there are some provisions that tell us that. Oh, one other thing is I want to follow up on this, the next tab. Because this is actually the picture that um, Mr. Forster uh, had. Again, it's kind of dark, so I'm, I'm, I'm sort of uh, apologize for that as well. But we have our concentric circles, some of circles, that are drawn around the power plant. That little green square that's on the yellow line, that look, that's the Millbury Steen's house. The other green things, they're all the other named talents that I represent. That's their houses. The farthest one is on the red line, which is 2,000 feet away. Now, according to the city, their impact of noise, air pollution, that doesn't count. But you know what? Somebody who's to the right of the red line, maybe 50, 100, 200, 300 feet, to the right of the red line on the star campus, their impacts matter because they're in the district. I don't think that's what neighborhood means. Not only does the case law tell us that that's probably not the case, but the ordinance tells us that too. Next step is the definition of neighborhood. We've already talked about this. So let's go to the next step. Next tab is tab 9, that's section 3217 of the zoning ordinance, where it creates a zoning district called BN, Neighborhood Shopping. And if you look down that list, permitted use number 17 is something called a neighborhood shopping center. Makes sense? That's what you have in neighborhood shopping, right? It turns out that the code actually does define what a neighborhood shopping center is. That's the next tab, tab 10. It's defined in section 32-4A78. And there it says that a neighborhood shopping center is a group of more than one retail store, personal service establishment, or offices located from the central business district to serve the local shopping needs of the residential area in which it is located. Notice that the definition doesn't say, well, it's the neighborhood defined by the zoning district. Instead, it's defined by the area, the people who live around the shopping center. It's a definition that uses a area, a distance concept. And you know what? If you apply the city's interpretation, that a neighborhood could only refer to people who live in the actual zoning district, guess what? There could be no residential area because residential uses are not permitted. 
going to be in districts. Nobody can live in one. For the city's definition or application to make sense, this ends up with a no set. It, it's, it doesn't make any sense at all because that's not what it means. Okay? And so we've got the definition, which suggests area, backed up by the Supreme Court. We've got the BN district in 3217, which suggests area instead of a district. And you know what? Even this board's, the provisions related to this board's operations, tell us something about what the ordinance is trying to get. That's the next tab, tab 11. It's section 3270 of the zoning board. And this is the one that says, this is what the board, you, need to do during a public hearing. And one of the things you need to do is you need to give notice by registered mail to the property owners of the five pieces of property, the five parcels going out in any direction from the property that is the subject matter. Now, if all we cared about was neighborhoods defined by districts, why would we look at five properties in any direction? It's because five properties in any direction are the people who are most likely affected by the decision that the board is going to make. And so those are the people who would be most likely who would want to attend a hearing of this nature. That's not district driven, it's distance driven. That's what neighborhood means. And you saw back on the earlier picture, and you can go back to it, it's tab seven. The appellants live, at least the name appellants, live very close to this facility. They're the ones who can hear the sound, who can feel the effects. A lot closer than almost half of the STC zoning district that the city wants to define. Adding neighborhood pretty conclusively says we have to look at an area around the plan, not look at the district. So, is there going to be an impairment? We've had a lot of argument about that tonight, so let's talk about it. First, air pollution. No one, neither the city nor TDC, has disputed Dr. Powder's affidavit, which is Appellate Exhibit 24, that says that pollution causes people to get sick. And that air pollution from this facility will worsen the respiratory conditions that have already been detected by the neighborhood health survey, the results of which are actually in the exhibits, I believe it's 35 to 1, uh, that you have. Undisputed. Instead, what they try to do is divert your attention. The city says, well, look, DENREC takes care of it. That's not our job. One, when the city wants to enforce an air pollution, they know how to do it. Tab 12 is the anti-idling ordinance that the city of New York has. And gee, when they wanted to pass it in the whereas clauses, they said things like the city of New York wishes to protect and conserve our environment. And we're very concerned about vehicle left idling, contributing air pollutants. So that's why we passed the statute. If the city wants to regulate or control air pollution, they can do it. Secondly, the ordinance doesn't give the job of enforcing zoning to anybody other than the city. They don't say, Dan Rack, we want you to take care of these zoning issues. And third, when we say Dan Rack can't do the job, we mean, A, they don't focus on the neighborhood, the area around the power plant. They focus on the state of Delaware. What's the year going to be for the whole state? Not the neighborhood. And what Appellants Exhibit 242 tells you is there aren't any monitors that Denmark has in the neighborhood. Denmark couldn't tell you if there was a bad impact. So the proof is there. On the way. Now, TDC says, well, you know, we're going to prove this. Less than the grid? Well, maybe the grid in D.C., because that's all the data they give you. They don't give you anything about what happens in New York. And secondly, wherever the grid things are, they're miles away. 
They're not 1,000 feet away from the Norbury Skyhouse generating those pollutants, which, because of low stacks, means the pollution gets to the ground faster. The other thing they say is we pollute less than price of That's cat. This is the table from table three from Mr. Barringer's affidavit. And he gives you a chart. And so what I did was I said, you know what, I'll go through and I'll put pink for the things where the number's higher, and I'll put yellow where it's lower. Guess what? Four of these six pollutants, the numbers are higher in your TPC. It's only VOCs and sulfur dioxide where Chrysler was high. And if you look at affidavit, uh, I'm sorry, Collins Exhibit 29, that's the affidavit of Abigail Sabbath. And she says, you know what? Not all pollutants are the same. Some are worse than others. And EPA's actually come up with a methodology that allows you to figure out the bad ones to give them more weight. And to give the less bad ones less weight. So she applied that application and methodology here. What does she find? That EPA, that according to that methodology, Chrysler's was 6,900 tons per year. TDC's is 71,000 tons per year. More than 10 tons per year. Okay? It's worse than Chrysler. If Chrysler even matters, I agree with Ms. Hoffman. We shouldn't even have to think about that. So there's clearly that. Property values. Their only argument is that the Davis study doesn't work. And we just heard Mr. Parks had to tell you, yes it does. He takes those things into account and he still comes up with an amount that shows that there's a decrease in property value when you have a property. We have power. We finally knew this. We did we gave you the study from Car Bot, and it's really on the way. They sent somebody out to stand next to a busy highway and say, gee, the numbers are high. What did he find? That in the Milbury Stein backyard, it's 30 to 40 decibels. They say, don't worry, we're going to comply with the law. Well, the law says it's got to be 52 decibels. And in his affidavit, he specifically says if it's 52 decibels at the property line, which is what the law requires, it's still going to impact their property because it will cover over the natural sounds that they would otherwise be able to hear. There's air pollution and health effects. There's property value. There's the noise, an increase in the noise, all yeah. of which are legitimate grounds to find it. Look, even if this is an accessory use, it violates the ordinance. The letter in saying it complies with the ordinance was wrongly issued, and that's why it should be retracted. And I'm asking you to order that the city retract it back, because that's what the law is. Any questions from you? Thank you, Mr. Crystal. Any questions for Mr. Crystal? Uh, Mr. Crystal, on my count, you have three minutes remaining. Uh, and at this point, uh, if the city and TDC would like to present some rebuttal, 